Today, of course, we're going to finish off Sartre, but we'll get into air. And air will dominate our attention next week, though we'll say a little about moral debate at the last lecture. Well then, what do we have to say about Sartre? I told you last time that in a peculiar way, existentialism stands or falls as a philosophical school on its concept of freedom, because that's its starting point and its distinctive message. Now Sartre feels that prior to himself, the concept of freedom was not fully understood, and partially this is because the message had not sunk in that anything was possible and anything was allowable. And what does this tell us about freedom? He discusses freedom on three levels. One is ontological. That's on the level of being. That is, do you have free will or not? Or are you determined? Are you like a clock? Or do you have free choices? The next level is psychological freedom. Because even if you had free will, you might not be able to exercise it fully without a certain state of mind. And then finally there's practical freedom, and that is what you actually do with it in terms of making choices in the real world. That's the realm of action. So we have the realm of being, the realm of your psychology, and the realm of action. Now let me explain what he means by these. He says, when you look at another person, you have a sense of the other. Another person is really not a person to you in terms of your percepts. That is, on, the only thoughts and emotions you feel are your own. Uh, you may think you empathize with others, but that's pure projection on your part. You see an expression on another person's face, and they look as you look in the mirror when you're angry. So you assume that they are angry, but you never feel anyone else's emotions, you never have anyone else's percepts, you never think anyone else's thoughts. So in a way, you endow everyone else with freedom. That is, you could treat them as robots. Uh, it's always possible that everyone else is a robot. That is, it's possible that they're just clever contrivances that mimic the behavior of yourself, but that they have no inner life. But that would be a silly way to interact with the world. The best thing to do is to project your mental life and say that others have a mental life as, all, as well, that they have genuine feelings, that they have thoughts, that they have their own percepts. But there's this distinction between yourself and the other. The other are just sense data. The people in this room are just a collection of sensations. Uh, uh, for all I know, you have no mental life or no emotional life, so I attribute freedom to you. I also have to attribute freedom to myself. It's always possible that my unconscious mind or something controls all of my conscious life, but you cannot actually behave that way. Again, if you wait for a billiard ball to knock you either towards visiting a sick friend or an escapist movie, you'll wait forever. Even if you don't have freedom, you have to operate under the presumption of freedom. I mean, you can't just sit there and wait for your unconscious mind to make a choice for you. Even if, it, even if it's really controlling the strings, you have to decide. You have to decide, I'm going to put aside my pleasure and visit my sick friend, or I'm not going to visit my friend, I really need to see a film, I'm upset, etc. So you see then that freedom is in a sense your creation, and not just your freedom, but the freedom of everyone else in the human race. That is a creative act on your part, to endow yourself with freedom and to endow them with freedom. This then is the ontological level, where you discuss questions like, are people free or are they like clocks? Are they determined? Uh, you can't treat yourself like a clock. It makes sense to assume that others aren't like clocks too, so you endow everyone with freedom. The next level is psychological. Even though you have freedom, unless you're aware that anything is allowable and anything is possible, you'll only trivialize your freedom. You'll be free to choose whether to eat hamburger or steak or spaghetti or a casserole. Uh, but to have significant freedom, you have to realize that the moral nihilist is correct. 
that there is no such thing as objectivity in ethics and therefore anything is allowable, like Smerdyakov and the brothers Karamazov. You remember he murdered his father when he became convinced that anything was allowable. The second thing that to give you absolute freedom is to realize that anything is possible and what he means by that we reviewed last time, that your parents may have influenced you but if you can only become aware of their influence you can transcend and reject it. Once you became aware that they conditioned you to feel guilt at dancing on Sunday, you can then shed that influence. So your culture will try to indoctrinate you, but if you become aware of your culture, you can transcend it. That's the psychological level of freedom, knowing that anything is possible and that anything is allowable. And then finally there's practical freedom, having the courage to be authentic. That is, you can say that anything is possible, but you can take the easy way out. You can say, well, it's just easier for me to copy the crowd, to fall in with social mores. But the authentic person realizes that that is no more a legitimate influence on you than any other, that you must actually create your own values and literally create yourself. This is why Sartre says that the soul of existentialism is that existence is prior to essence. He says, Plato told you there's an essence of human beings sitting up there in the world of forms, and all the people in this room are just imperfect copies of that human being, or that all the human societies that exist on the face of the earth are just a copy of the essence of human society. So he says, the ancients told us that essence was prior to existence that the essence of humanity was the real thing and you were just imperfect copies of it. He says, I'm telling you the reverse. The existing human being creates the only humanity you've got. As an existing human being, anything is possible for you. And if you give a shape to your life and a shape to your character, that's totally your free choice. So the existential person is the one who creates whatever essence your nature has. Over there. With this concept of freedom and this concept of practical freedom, um, how does it fit into like the, the, the idea of reality? I mean, you know, there are certain laws of physics say, you know, you can't jump yes. off a tall You can't building. jump off a tall building. So as a physical object, you are determined. But in terms of your characterological development, you're totally free to create out of your raw material whatever kind of human being you like. Uh, I mean, society will try to put limits on you, and, but if you can only become aware of those influences, I guess you could read some cross-cultural anthropology, couldn't you? You could read Ruth Benedict. You'd think, you know, for the first time I realized that I've been programmed to want a 200 square foot house and, you know, a big car and to have a conventional marriage. And once you become aware of all those influences, you can then transcend them. That, of course, is the level of psychological freedom. Now, of course, you can be inauthentic and just say, even though I realize how ab arbitrary all these social conditioning factors are, the easy way is to just run with the crowd. But the authentic person realizes that even that is an existential choice. You know, you can choose to abandon your own individual life experiment. Uh, why we should label that <coughs> authentic, of course, and the other inauthentic, if we're complete value relativists, we'll have to ask, won't we? I mean, if we can't make any objective judgments about good and evil, it sounds very odd to say that people who are authentic are somehow more worthy of praise than people who are inauthentic. But let's hold that for our critique of Sartre. I mean, at present it's clear that anyone that he respects is going to be authentic and will choose to fashion their own nature out of raw material by their own creative choices. Over here, you had your hand up. Um, can't physical limits also impact a character development as well though? So Although he's talking about anything possible in terms of character development, can't certain physical limits also influence? Yes, well you couldn't translate your genetic limits and become Mozart, could you? Because you wouldn't probably have the genes that would allow for his creativity in music. Or you're limited in that you can't become an Einstein. Um, 
he's, he's not talking so much about your intellect or your body as your character. You can essentially adopt any value system you want. Uh, Nietzsche has often said that the Superman could transvalue, you know, rise above values. That the Superman didn't inherit his values, he created them. Well, Sartre's democratizing this. He's saying the average person, if they only become fully aware that anything is possible and anything is allowable, they too can be a transvaluator. They can create whatever characterological structure in terms of values you want. Now, maybe you can't make yourself courageous enough to fight unarmed with a tiger, that a certain human instincts might take over of fear under those conditions, and you don't have claws, do you? Uh, but you can, however, create your own mores and therefore create your own character. In other words, existence is prior to essence. Well then, we now understand Sartre's claim that he has given us a unique analysis of freedom. Now let's criticize him on each of these three levels. We'll start with ontological freedom. Even if it is true that we should take introspection at face value, and say, well, no billiard ball will knock me towards an escapist movie or towards the hospital to visit my sick friend. Just knowing <coughs> that you have that freedom can't call that purely negative freedom. I mean, take a Mexican jumping bean. It's free in a sense, isn't it? I mean, it can jump almost anywhere. But it's a random freedom of no human significance. Or take an electron. I take it electrons pop from one shell to an atom of, to another shell but they're totally unpredictable. And Kant said, well, who would value that negative freedom? That's the freedom of aimlessness. The only time you value freedom is when you can make something positive of it. And of course, from Kant's point of view, that had to mean that you had objective moral principles, the categorical imperative. He thought the categorical imperative was a sort of truth test and that told you what moral principles passed it and which didn't, and you then had the freedom to choose to live in a card with your principles and to resist temptation. You had first the, you could be intellectually honest, you could look at your principles in the light of reality. If you believe that certain races were superior to others, you could use reason to convince yourself that that was silly, and you could of course use your freedom to resist temptation and live up to your principles. But according to Sartre, we are nihilists. That is, we see that all principles are reduced to the triviality of zero. So the course question is, even if we accept the argument uh, that introspectively we have to make choices, aren't these choices purely negative choices without some standard? Is freedom worth anything? We'll re revisit this in a moment. Secondly, what about the psychological level of freedom? Well, as Marx pointed out, uh, a peasant in medieval Europe, it may be true that if the peasant were enlightened, they would see all, the, all values were relative. And if the peasant was enlightened, he would see that any social influence that preyed on him, he could in theory reject. But 99% of humanity has never studied existentialist philosophy, and probably 99% of humanity never will. So it's really only a small elite of intellectuals who are going to look at the history of Western philosophy and see that all truth tests were bankrupt, and realize that none of the arguments for the existence of God hold water. So only a very small percentage of humanity are ever going to realize that they ought to be nihilists and that they have the ability to transcend all cultural influences. And as we'll see, the Marxists said, this is just Horatio Alger stuff. You know, uh, the average worker has brutalizing toil 12 hours a day, is absolutely fatigued when they get home and has no cultural or intellectual life. It's all very well to say that anything is possible for such a person on the ontological level, but on the psychological level nothing is possible. They're involved in a 12-hour a day struggle to survive to feed their family at minimum wages. While you may have more freedom than that today, 
uh, you of course are indoctrinated twelve hours a day to be good consumers, have you not? You may have given up the burden of working for a living for the burden of having to consume all day for your psychological sanity. I don't know how many of people showed you, uh, saw of you saw on television last night the documentary on shopaholics, where you know there's this one woman who is buying dresses without trying them on, and they rationally convinced her that that was a stupid thing to do. And the moment they turned her back, she had gone over to another aisle and was buying dresses without ever trying them on. So uh, it's all very well to say you can make such a person aware of the fact that they've been indoctrinated and they will transcend it. But actually very few people attain that level of awareness, uh, a fragment of humanity. And they say, the Marxists said, this is very much like telling workers that all they need to do is change the inside of their heads to liberate themselves. <coughs> uh, this is only possible for a, a few bourgeois intellectuals. Finally, what about practical freedom? Well, so we can revolutionize society whenever we want. That is, if all of us in this room collectively and all New Zealanders realize that all of our values were arbitrary and that all uh, ethics was relative and all we had to do was to be aware of the mores of New Zealand society to revolutionize them, where do we go? You know, revolutionize them with what in mind? What, what is the next step? So we kick over the status quo. Uh, what is the utopia we seek? And uh, you'd have a sort of permanent revolution that was totally formless and chaotic. Uh, a revolution with no direction, again, is to just say we want a world like Mexican jumping beans. Well, no one really wants such a world. So the general critique of Sartre's three levels of freedom are, again, that even if he is correct, on the ontological level, he has only negative freedom, not positive freedom. Secondly, that he is sociologically naive, that the mass of humanity are never going to come to the state of awareness that he talks about, of believing that anything is allowable and anything is possible. And even if the mass of us did come to that conclusion, what is the point of a permanent revolution without direction? where every day you change things just because they're arbitrary, and what do you change them to? You change them to some new thing which is by definition arbitrary. And the next day you can change it for something that's arbitrary. But there's no significance in any of it. Now let me summarize then. Uh, the traditional critique of Marx, particularly the Marxist critique, would be that you cannot create an analysis of the human condition purely through psychological introspection. That you can try to dismiss society as an influence which if you understand you will transcend. Uh, but people have to make a living. That is, they have to keep body and soul together. They have to sustain their families. They have to have at least a minimum level of goods in order to create. And the system of production, the whole society, sets limits. And they would say this is a point of view which effectively leaves people without any structure to their lives. Marx made, pardon me, Sartre made certain overtures to the Communist Party in France and they consistently rejected them. They said this is nothing but bourgeois idealism. You know, what sort of message is this for the working class? If they only changed the picture of society inside their heads, they would have a permanent revolution. And again, they said this is Horatio Algerism, that the individual can change their life conditions through their own internal efforts, when what is actually needed is a class party based on the objective circumstances and alienation of the working class, where you have a united effort towards a better society. And uh, Sartre at that point, attempted to sort of invent a sociology, uh, but it was a Hobbesian one. That is, he essentially said, well, once you give yourself the freedom to create, you recognize that the next person is someone that you have to give the freedom to create, and therefore you can imagine a lot of individuals, all of whom respect one another's autonomy. So the sort of society that such autonomous individuals would work towards, who respected one another's autonomy, 
would be a society in which we would all have the freedom to maximize our creativity. Uh, in other words, it's sort of like Hobbes with art uh, added to it. I take it Hobbes felt that in the state of nature everyone's hand was turned against everyone else. So you sort of made a social pact because anarchy is unpleasant for everyone, correct? The state of nature. So you make a social contract in which you contract out of the state of nature and set up a sovereign. The only problem is that even in Hobbes's, uh, in Sartre's Hobbesist sociology, there's no sovereign. That is, you don't get out of this aimless situation where everyone is creating things arbitrarily by setting up someone who gives structure because their values are now taken as dominant, like Hobbes as sovereign. <coughs> Even if I respect your creativity and you respect mine, well, what does that mean? I guess it means that I won't steal your paints or your canvas and that you won't steal my block of marble that I want to sculpt. So we'll have a peace treaty of sorts in which we're each exercising our creativity, but you recognize, I recognize that whatever I'm sculpting is purely arbitrary, and you recognize that whatever you're painting is purely arbitrary. Now, I guess this could be a society of artists who said even though there are no objective standards in art, I've got an inner impulse to create, and it's true I'll get bored with that within a few years, but I'll go on to another inner impulse to create. I think you can see that this would be a very unsatisfactory sociology from a Marxist point of view. I think we have to ask ourselves, if existentialism is incapable of a sociological dimension, what does it come down to? Well, it seems to come down to no more than Kant plus the nihilist fallacy. Kant was the one who originated the argument that everyone has to treat themselves as if they have at least negative freedom, that you have to make the choice and no billiard ball can make it for you. Okay, that may be true on a psychological level. But once you add nihilism to it, that is that no human creation is any better than any other and all are just a matter of taste, you have then trivialized positive freedom and there seems to be no then distinctive contribution of existentialism except Kantian psychology plus a mistake. You remember the nihilist fallacy is a fallacy. That is just because we can't say that your ideals have passed a truth test, they can still be worth a great deal to you if you deeply internalize them and believe in them. Uh, they may be arbitrary but they're your own. That is what defines me partially as a human being, that is that I have humane ideals and that there are plenty of people around like Gracious who have anti-humane anti -human, anti ideals and I want the world to resemble what I think it ought to be more than they think it ought to be. So my principles give me a positive spin to my creativity and emphasizing that they are merely arbitrary is a mistake. They haven't flunked a truth test, they're not like a hallucination, they're worth what they're worth to me. It's interesting to note that Sartre, under the impact of Nazism, became in a, cell, in a sense himself inauthentic. He started talking about that existentialism had its own ethic, and its own ethic was effectively that you should respect the creativity of others. In other words, it began to very suppose to bear a very suspicious resemblance to the ideals of the French Revolution, that is, liberty, equality, and fraternity. That is, that we ought to feel fraternal feelings for one another because we were all autonomous value creators. We ought to respect all as equals, that we shouldn't interfere with the creativity of anyone else, and then we could all live in a liberating way. We could each follow our own self-created path. But many of his followers pointed out what, uh, what status did these principles have? Did they have objective status or were they purely arbitrary? In other words, to tell us to be authentic, was this some type of a moral proposition? That we ought to be authentic? Or was he merely saying that those who have a taste for rejecting convention ought to do so?
while those who have a taste to embrace convention are totally free to do so. Did he um, not, did it, I mean, did he have any envisage, sorry, did he envisage at all the concept of one person's freedom um, causing an interference with another person? Yes, that was, that was what he finally, he, try, he wrote an essay called, Is Existentialism a Humanism? because he himself had become disturbed. After all, there was Hitler tromping around, wasn't there? And he wanted some moral position. Uh, I mean, were Nazis creating values? You know, well, they were certainly creating a lot of trouble, and they were certainly changing the face of Europe. So were they value creators? And this gives you the question, aren't, aren't you going to have to say some value creations are more acceptable than others? And obviously Sartre didn't want Europe to go in the Nazi direction, did he? So at that point he began to say, well, existential in itself gives us values, rather like uh, Ruth Benedict, you know, saying that ethical skepticism gives you values, or <coughs> ethical relativism gives you values. And uh, Sartre said, well, can't we now see from our diagnosis that we ought to be authentic, we shouldn't just accept, you know, the folk myths of a Nordic past. Uh, we ought to be authentic and reject all conventional impulses. But since I value my own creativity, I ought to place a value on your creativity. And if the two conflict, there should be some amicable compromise that preserves maximum creativity for both of us. But this looks very much like a slide back into uh, a set of ethical principles that you're no longer treating as arbitrary. So Sartre himself seemed to find no way out of the aimlessness of the permanent revolution and the aimlessness of my individual rebellion against convention except to superimpose a set of principles. But it doesn't look like the principles are sufficient, does it? It may solve the social problem of I'm not tromping on you when I exercise my creativity but it still gives me no direction. Let's imagine I now have a safe sphere that no one else will tread into, and I can exercise my creativity within that sphere. Now Sartre may say the mere fact that you have to ask how to exercise your creativity shows you don't have it. All right, uh, that may be true, but I would certainly be like 99% of humanity in that. Any other questions then as to why uh, I don't like usually when I study a philosopher to deliver so devastating a critique. That is, if I had taught you Plato, I would have found much of merit in Plato, and there are many things in Hobbes that are worth hanging on to, and so forth. I must admit an existentialist philosophy, it seems to me that we have little more than ethical skepticism, which existentialism didn't invent, you know, ex uh, ex ethical skepticism starts creeping in with Hobbes. We have the analysis of subjective freedom, which existentialism <laughs> didn't invent. That was invented by Kant. And then we have the nihilist fallacy, which is a fallacy. And I don't think that the sum total contribution of, of the school really is very substantial. And you really turning the nihilist fallacy by criticizing Sartre where you are because you're saying he's imposing arbitrary restrictions in saying they're valueless, while at the same time criticizing him for doing the same thing? Well, I, I say he can't have it both ways, is all I'm really saying. If he, he either is going to say every value creation has a value of zero. I mean, that's the nihilist view. I mean, they all have uh, a reduced uh, makes no difference whether my value creation is to cut off my ear or my value creation is to paint a great sta a painting or my value creation is to push a child in front of a truck. I mean, either we have no standard for arbitra or we do have a standard. Now, if we do have a standard, isn't it in a sense beyond the creating game? I mean, is it just an arbitrary creation? Then we still have no standard. This is the point I'm making, that it seems to me he either has a point at which the value creating stops or the whole thing is pointless. And if he has a point at which the value creating stops, he ought to give a reason why it stops there. And I can't see uh, an answer for this in Sartre.
Um, just Kant's argument or rejection of ontological freedom, you said that... Um, well, Kant rejected ontological determinism. He said, you can't behave as if you're a determined object. But he said also that gives you only negative freedom. Positive freedom, you want to ring in the categorical imperative. Yeah, well, positive freedom um, being dependent on, says, I was saying, it's like principles or like acting in accord with your moral principles. But isn't that um, going back on what you have to grant Sartre and that you have to first grant nihilism? Yes, but you see, we don't have to grant him nihilism, do we? That's based on a mistake. That is, my principles are not hallucinations that have flunked a truth test. If there is no truth test in ethics, they neither have objectivity, that is, I can't claim they're worthy of your regard even though you don't share them, but I don't have to classify my deeply held principles as not worthy of my regard because they flunk something. Uh, if you want to tell me they're no more significant than my taste for Coca-Cola, I'll say that's absurd. That is, Coca-Cola, if I were deprived of Coca-Cola, uh, it would not make much difference to me to be thrown back on Pepsi-Cola. If I were deprived of being able to act on my humane principles, I would no longer be the sort of person I am. Now, if Sartre's message is that when you live up to your own deeply involved principles, they help define whom you are, and that as a modern person you should criticize those principles in the light of reason and evidence. But remember, that will never hand you a set of principles. You will always come back to the bedrock of what you are committed to. I mean, if you're committed to racist principles, you may see that they force you to falsify data about racial differences. Uh, but once you have shunted away those principles that run into either scientific evidence or logic, you're left with a core of principles and all you can say about it is, here I stand. And uh, uh, that doesn't mean you're a nihilist, uh, because where you choose to stand, you feel makes enormous difference. It's the core of your personality, over here. Um, I was just wondering why it seems to me that um, Sartre basically hovers on this line of of, basic, of saying that it is individual freedom that is the basic principle. And I don't see why that is necessarily against his whole idea of arbitrary, of arbitrary ethics. If it's logically, if the logic is that I have, that I have freedom to change, to change my psychological Thing. everyone else has freedom to change it. If you're going to keep that logic, then you have to have principle. You have to have a world view which states that no one, that any um, infringement on the ability of other people to be free, is in fact against the state of the world. Well, do we have to, let's remember again the flaws in the utilitarian argument. You know, everyone values happiness, therefore we ought to maximize the happiness of the greatest number. It jumps the case, it jumps the gap between egoism and altruism, isn't it? I mean, why, what if my value creations, like the builder of a great cathedral, require sacrificing the lives of thousands of peasants? Why should I enlighten them to the point where they realize that the religious ideals I'm using to manipulate them are arbitrary. Uh, in other words, once you <coughs> leap the gap between egoism and altruism in ethics, uh, of course you've solved one of its fundamental <coughs> problems. And then you can go on to have an ethical system of Sartre. But I see nothing in Sartre that implies that if I realize, let's say I become totally authentic, and I realize that I have been raised to be a university lecturer and that actually this is just an indoctrination in me by my Irish background because Irish love to jabber and that I really ought to transcend that and perhaps even though I'd be a second-rate one, I should be a pianist, okay? You know, I'm now authentic. And let us imagine that I'm very poor and if I murder you, I can buy a piano. Well, it's true I've snuffed out your freedom, but so what? You know, how do we then say it is morally wrong, are we saying, for me to stifle your creativity? And if so, where did that moral principle come from? <laughs>
more that it's kind of a more that it's kind it's a kind of twisting and kind of breaking of what he would view as the um, laws of the you know the, the fundamental laws of nature, which are ironically like you know there are no sorry if everything is possible and you've just reduced pos a possibility you've made you know you've taken you've taken away a possibility therefore there is less possibility isn't that then I mean, isn't he essentially saying that it's actually impossible to um, impinge on someone's freedom? I mean, isn't his entire argument contradictory? Well, I'd say there's a hidden premise here, and that is that all men are equal, work of evil, equal regard. If you sneak in that premise, that all human beings are worthy of equal regard, it certainly follows that you can't favor my creativity over your creativity, but only because of that suppressed premise. And trying to establish that all human beings enter the circle of moral concern is the most fundamental problem of ethics. And I can't see that Sartre gives, I think Nietzsche would say this, this attempt to democratize my doctrine is insane, you know. Uh, once you do, and, and Nietzsche, of course, was not an nihilist. You know, he was a more sophisticated thinker. He just said, uh, no, uh, yes, art is a convention, so what? You can't have art without a convention. You know, every artist works within some sort of convention. Even modern artists like Ralph Hodery work within the convention of minimalism, or you work within Baroque, or you work within classical, or you work within Rococo. But within those traditions, wonderful things are possible. So while no tradition may be better than any other, within them each there are outstanding talents who are above everyone else. And why shouldn't they exercise their creativity at the expense of people who are fifth-rate pianists? You know, or fifth-rate. Now you can always say, well, not my cup of tea, but that's Nietzsche's point. And he would say that Sartre has really betrayed Nietzsche, that he has sneaked in the notion that all people are to be admitted within our circle of moral concern. He has then said, which is patently false, that all people are capable of significant creativity. And with those two premises, he can certainly have everyone respecting everyone else's creativity. I mean, I've criticized Sartre from my perspective, but that's at least an effort to criticize him from Nietzsche's perspective. Uh, that rather than being, I mean, Nietzsche is often called the father of existentialism and Sartre the son. But I think the father would disown the son in this case, and I rather suspect he has pretty good reasons for doing so. I don't want to cut this discussion off because that's what a philosophy course is all about, but have we exhausted our uh, remember again, this is not a course in indoctrination. There are plenty of Europeans who would tell me that I'm completely wrong. That is, the continent of Europe, existentialism still has a real presence in philosophy. And uh, w once when uh, a person was arguing with an existentialist uh, using the arguments I do, he said, well, he has the soul of a cow, you see. But that's not a very convincing defense, is it? That sounds more like invective. Uh, any, anyone uh, want to discuss Sartre a bit more? Okay, well let's then begin Air. You see, I think Air is a good contrast to Sartre. First I put him in the course because this brings us up to date in your own philosophical tradition. I mean, this is the Anglo-Saxon philosophical tradition in which New Zealanders are a spin-off, is it not? So this brings us up to the present in a number of ways. Uh, Sartre brings us up to the present in terms of much European philosophizing. Uh, Ayer brings us up to date with much of Anglo-Saxon philosophizing. And I think you'll see that in a way Sartre and Ayer have similar beginnings. They both begin with the notion that there are no truth tests in ethics, that there is no objective standard that we can use to classify our ideals as true or false. Uh, but Ayer, of course, would say he just doesn't start ranting and raving about this. He, remain, he has a cool head. But rather than dividing the world into revolutionaries and non-revolutionaries and authentic and unauthentic, we should get on with whatever principles we've internalized 
but not make exaggerated claims for them. Now, he also starts from a different point. Sartre started from introspection, didn't he? You look within yourself and you see what you find there. And if you're a reflective person, you find the realization that anything is possible and anything is allowable. Air starts, as so much of English philosophy does, with language. And he says, true and false apply to statements. That is, you can't say an object is true or false. An object exists or it doesn't exist. You can't say an emotion is true or false. It can be a powerful emotion or a weak emotion. Truth and false have to do with propositions. And here we have to distinguish literal meaning from non-literal meaning, because only literal meaning can be true. Non-literal meaning may be emotionally effective. If you say uh, the sun is bright, that means something literally. It means that if you stare at the sun, it's going to hurt your eyes. If you say God is yellow, you may mean something by that, but you don't mean it literally, do you? You may mean something poetic, such as to a believing person, God is like the sun, that is the center of their universe, that is the statement God is yellow, may be uh, designed to make you suddenly think in terms of God and the sun, and just as the sun is the center of the solar system, God should be the center of your existence. But it's not a literal proposition. It's a proposition that's meant to stir an emotion of awe about God. It may make you realize God's majesty, that just as the sun controls the solar system, God controls the universe. So God is yellow then it has, may have a poetic meaning or an artistic meaning, but it has no literal meaning and therefore it's stupid to say that it's true or false. You don't go around saying, gee, is God yellow or is he green or is he purple? You evaluate the utterance in terms of its aesthetic effect, don't you? So it has a meaning, but it's not literal meaning. It hasn't got anything to do with truth. All statements that have literal meaning are either analytic or synthetic, according to Ayer. Now, what he means by that is this. Uh, let's imagine synthetic statements are either statements of fact or cause-effect connections. And he says if you think carefully, you'll see that such synthetic assertions have truth value only if we can imagine an empirical test for them. Now, I think I may have given you this illustration before. You can have putative propositions that pretend to make a claim of fact, but you see they are bankrupt on examination. <coughs> imagine I said to you there's an invisible immaterial leprechaun dancing on that table. Well, that seems to be very much the same sort of proposition as that my hand is resting on the table, isn't it? Grammatically, the two are identical. But you can verify whether my hand is on the table. There you see it is, there you see it isn't. You've now, and now it would be a false proposition. About the leprechaun, if I say I can't see it, you say, well, I told you it was invisible. If I say, well, I can't feel it, you say, I told you it was immaterial. And now you see the proposition in terms of cash value is equivalent to saying that there is no leprechaun on the table, isn't it? <coughs> That is, to make the claim of an invisible immaterial leprechaun gives rise to no different expectations in terms of human experience than to deny the existence of the leprechaun. So synthetic propositions are propositions that claim that something exists or they claim a state of affairs, such as that one thing influences another causally. And these propositions, if they are to have truth value, we must at least be able to imagine what would test them. As we'll see in a moment, you can have perfectly coherent synthetic propositions and we can't actually apply the truth test. If you told me flowers grow on the far side of the moon, I could give you a lot of arguments why that's a crazy thing to believe, but we can't look at the far side of the moon, or we couldn't when I was young. Now we could send a rocket around it with a camera, could we? But when I was young, you couldn't send rockets to the moon. And I take it the moon always shows the same face to the earth. That is, it goes around the earth in the same amount of time that it rotates on its axis. So we never see the opposite side of the moon. 
But it would be perfectly sensible to say there are flowers, let's put it this way, there would be a truth value in saying that there are flowers on the other side of the moon. I think I could very quickly convince you that it had negative truth value. But at least it wouldn't be like the invisible immaterial leprechaun. That is a senseless proposition because we can't imagine any way to test its truth. Unless you say, unless you say uh, there's an invisible immaterial leprechaun here except unless you have the magic spectacles. Oh yes. I mean, if you're, I mean, then, then, you would, then you would be <laughs> making it, you'd bring, bringing it into the realm of synthetic proposition and the, we'd then ask you, well, what is the principle of construction of these spectacles? And uh, why don't you construct a lot of them and we'll all put them on and then we'll see, won't we? Uh, so at that point, you certainly can test it. So if you said there's an invisible immaterial leprechaun sitting on that table, but it's not invisible, let's say it's merely uh, has to be viewed through light with a red wavelength. And I will give you spectacles that filter out everything but light with a red wavelength and then you'll see it. Okay, now you're talking business, aren't you? But now we can tell you to put up or shut up, can't we? You know. You're now making the proposition one we can test. And uh, Ayer says that's the price of it having literal truth value. You're not just saying uh, I'm telling a story about leprechauns to entertain children. <coughs> then we would judge your story not in terms of its literal meaning, but in terms of its capacity to amuse children, would we? It would be like God is yellow. But he would say if you reflect on it, does it ever make sense to make a literal synthetic claim. By a synthetic claim he means a claim about something that exists or influences something that exists. Does it ever make sense to make a literal synthetic claim if you cannot even imagine how you would test the truth of it? You may not in fact be able to test the truth. You might say there are particles that are smaller than quarks that we can't yet detect. Okay, that's perfectly sensible <coughs> to say. That's possible. And you, we would then say, well, let's see if we can invent something, you know, that will allow us to... Isn't his own theory that he's putting forward here a literal synthetic claim? Well, that's an interesting question. We'll get to that a bit later when we criticize air. Because uh, at times you get the impression he is pulling a shortcut. Uh, that he's saying something. Propositions are only meaningful if you can test them against the senses. That raises the question, how could we test that proposition against the senses, doesn't it? Yeah, well, let's just wait on that. We'll hold that in the background. Let's give him a chance to get his, state his case before we attack his case. Uh, I think the point you made is, I think there's an answer to it, but I don't think Ayer ever gives it. That is, I don't think the question you've asked is unanswerable, but I think you'll look in vain in Ayer for an answer, and that's disturbing. Now the other type of proposition that has literal meaning is an analytic proposition. Analytic propositions are like the propositions of pure mathematics. They are significant, but they don't pretend to make any claims about the real world. If you said to me, a perfect triangle has 180 degrees, I would understood what you meant, and you'd mean something very sensible. But note that you haven't claimed there is such a thing as a perfect triangle in the physical universe, have you? For example, that would be a different claim. If you said the triangle that I have drawn on the blackboard has exactly 180 degrees, I would say, well, certainly you mean roughly, don't you? <laughs> because it couldn't exactly have 180 degrees because we can't draw exactly straight lines and perfect angles. Or you might say, okay, the triangles between heavenly bodies have exactly 180 degrees because light, they're connected by light. And while I can't draw straight lines on the blackboard, light can pass straight through the heavens. Now that actually would be <coughs> highly interesting because while in theory it seems to, it looks good, doesn't it? We find when we measure them they have more than 180 degrees which is one of the reasons why we think we live in curved space. More about that a bit later. But you can see then what Ayer is saying, that the propositions of mathematics are perfectly sensible, 
but they are quite different from synthetic propositions. If I wanted to convince you that uh, a triangle has 180 degrees, I wouldn't ask you to observe anything. I would just remind you of what a degree is, and that is by definition a degree is 1 360th of the arc of a great circle. That's all we mean by a degree. You know, 1 360th of the arc of a great circle. And now divide that arc into four. Each of these has to have 90 degrees, doesn't it? All right? So a square would have 360 degrees, wouldn't it? Four angles. And what is a triangle but half a square? So you see, I've now demonstrated that a triangle has 180 degrees. Because a degree is 1 360th of the arc of a great circle, you mush those angles around, you've got a square, so a square has to have 360 degrees, and a triangle has 180. But note that that was a proof of logic, wasn't it? We didn't observe anything. We didn't go and look at Cathedral Square and Christchurch, or we didn't look at a triangle that I drew on the blackboard. We used logic. Well, we'll have to stop at that point. But next time we'll see where air goes from here.